Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this uh, very, very important hearing. I'd like to go to Ethiopia, if I could, talk about El Nino, talk about this historic impact it's having in Ethiopia, uh, generational, um, the impact it's having that could lead to malnutrition for millions of kids um, in um, Ethiopia, uh, and uh, what we're doing, or what can we do to help? This is clearly an exacerbated form of the climate change impacts that we're seeing, um, and uh, that part of the world is particularly vulnerable. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Senator. And I actually was recently in Ethiopia a few months ago and was able to see some of the preparations as they were, um, as they were bracing for El Nino. Um, our total request in this budget is $513 million for Ethiopia. And, so, and that includes our work, uh, a lot of our work in the resilience of uh, communities that, have, that are susceptible to the, to the shocks that you see uh, when, there is a, when there is a drought uh, a lot in the dry lands. Uh, there also includes a lot of our work with them on um, on governance, on health, and uh, on some of the some of the health care, some of the um, uh, the health infrastructure that we that we um, that we help them with. Um, so, so how how are you coordinating? You know, feed the future in your work on this issue. Could you talk about that? So that's something the USAID is. First of all, we are right now actively looking at what kind of posture we need to have on the response side. And so we have put additional food resources and food aid into Ethiopia um, since this crisis has become more acute. So I think I want to make sure that we say that first. Concurrent to that, though, we, we see the ability for agriculture to make a difference. Really, in a country like Ethiopia, it's a lot about land management, water management, teaching people how to use crops that are drought resistant, and really helping them. And I think that we see a lot of that. You know, Ethiopia is one of the countries that was part of the um, <clears throat> the food alliance that we were, the African Food Alliance. And so those are the kinds of things that they have a direction they want to go. We want to help them get there. But right now, we're really focused on kind of the acute need that's that are so evident. Okay. So how how is AID incorporating climate change into the developmental risk assessment which you're making as you look at the different regions of the world? So I think there, there's a policy issue at play and then there's a pragmatic issue. So the, there is an executive order that the president signed which requires USAID and other federal agencies to include climate considerations in all of their programming. USAID has taken that to heart. And so all of our strategies and all of our work and all of our projects now include a climate component, ensuring that we take those things into consideration so that we don't build schools in potential flood zones, so that we consider the availability of water on our agricultural projects. And I think that's kind of the step one in that space. Okay, so why, why is that important in terms of US, using U.S. tax dollars wisely that we have thought through the climate change impacts in these different regions? Well, you know, there's a project that, that I was recently briefed on that I think is, it's a project that USAID is doing with NASA where we are using satellite data to help watershed managers in Pakistan. And the idea is that when we have data about how much water should be flowing, when it should be flowing, looking at that data over the course of a year, multiple years, it helps us to understand, so how much can be diverted for agriculture? How much needs to remain to keep the aquaculture? Those are the kinds of questions we can begin to answer because we've done the right work and we have the right technology to do it. Yeah, the, the problems in uh, sub-Saharan Africa were actually the first mm -hmm. problems. Um, uh, first area is kind of identified as the problem area for climate change. This goes back to 1976 when it's actually on the first day I came to Congress, the story on the front page of the uh, Washington Star, which was the other paper in town at the time, was on climate change and its impacts on sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a 40-year-old, and talk about how it was going to intensify regional conflicts as they fought over limited resources, the, 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 the impacts on water, et cetera, then let, would lead to gangs kind of fighting over what was left over. And so all of that has now been borne out. And, um, uh, and I'd just like, if I could, then to move over to uh, Power Africa for a, a second, because uh, two out of three people in sub-Saharan Africa still don't have electricity. And uh, you're making a request here for additional money for 
uh, Power Africa. Can you talk a little bit about that and what progress we've made and what you hope to do perhaps over the next five years? So this request includes $291 million for Power Africa. And I think the ambitious goals that we've set around electrifying Africa, and then this, of course, thanking this committee for the work they've done on path, you know, working on the authorization is something that is important to USAID. It affirms the work we do. It reinforces the message that we, we think this, these are valuable things. Um, we've made a tremendous amount of progress right now. We've already got 4,300 megawatts that have already been brought to bear. That's very good for a project that's in its first few years. But what's most important to a lot of us at aid is the fact that we've brought $43 billion of out private and public sector investment into the space. So in an area where aid is contributing a small amount of funding, that all that funding is being matched, doubled, tripled, and quadrupled with private sector funding. That is really something that we, we think is very valuable for an effort that's so broad and such a, you know, such a big policy statement. Yeah, uh, I went with the president to Africa last uh, July, and uh, in Ethiopia, we had a signing of an agreement. And uh, uh, and so could you talk a little bit about the geothermal potential in Ethiopia and these other surrounding countries and what we're doing in order to telescope the time frame it will take to extract those uh, energy resources for the people of those countries? Well, I want to I want to thank you and thank you for taking the time to, to make the visit. Um, as a budget person, I think you've tapped my knowledge of geothermal energy, I'm sorry. Um, but I will bring that question back and we would love to make sure we talk more about it with you and your team. By the way, I will say that the utility executives and regulators in those countries reminded me a lot of the same executives in America <laughs> in terms of their, do we really have to do this? Do we really have to move to geothermal? Do we really have to move to solar? Yeah, it's sunny every day here. You know, maybe we could do that. And we could just see the, they had to show up at the ribbon cutting. They had to, you know, smile, but you could just see they were doing it through gritted teeth. And it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a good thing USAID is there. It's a good thing these other agencies are there because they have the credibility to help them to, um, to kind of almost double their electricity generation in just two or three years for the entire country. You know, just, it's just amazing and it's working and we thank you for your great work.